Well, praise the Lord. I want to thank everybody for joining us. And uh, we're going to be studying tonight out of the book of Isaiah. There's going to be a lot of different passages that we're going to turn to in the book of Isaiah. Before we get started, I just want to say that um, many times, you know, whenever we study the gospel and there's a new trend even in the church today, that the gospel is being transformed or presented in such a way that it's always uh, people are attempting to make it so relevant to our individual lives that in the long run, we may miss the essence of what God's trying to say. What I'm trying to say is this, is that if we move so closely to applying the gospel to our own personal lives without being willing to back up and survey the overall plan of God, we have an imbalanced gospel. You know, what I mean is, is that when you can back up far enough to see the forest, you can see it for, the, for its magnitude and you can see its overall arching, uh, you know, what it represents. Whereas when you move up close to a tree, you see, you can see the intricacies of that tree. You can even see the bark. You can see the cracks in the bark. Sometimes if you've ever peeled a piece of bark back, you see all kinds of insects that are scurrying around. Sometimes our lives seem like those little insects inside of that bark. I want you to know that God has a plan, amen, for the entirety of the world and each and every human being that has ever walked upon the face of the earth, but he also has a plan for your individual lives. But you and I need to understand the gospel from the perspective of the way that God wrote the gospel. And so many times what I'll do is I put this chronology up here and I use these maps also. And, you know, some of you that have been around for a while, you may say, you know, you keep drawing these maps and you keep talking about these timelines. And I don't really know that I'm getting any more of this in my spirit than I ever was before. But to be honest with you, I believe that you are. Whether you think you are or not, I believe that the more I say it, the more I bring it before you, the deeper it's getting into your spirit. And it's important for us to, to remind ourselves of these things because there's an overall concept context from which the scriptures were written and if we miss the context then we miss what the what the holy spirit was speaking through the original author to the original audience and so just to remind you of some things that many i'm sure that you haven't really forgotten but according to the way that the word of god is written that there was a cataclysmic fall that was caused from adam and the result of this is that each and every human being that has ever been born of adam has been born with this thing called a sinful nature the seed of sin is in him. You, you, you sin because you're born a sinner. See, the fruit of sin is just the fruit is just that. It's the fruit of a root. And, and the, what the gospel wants to ultimately bring is it wants to cause a separation or a death between the relationship of the sinful nature, amen, through what Jesus did at the cross. But God has been for thousands of years of human history methodically bringing this plan to pass. And it's very important that we understand that, you know, we understand the flood because evil had spread over the globe. And, but yet God called a man named Abraham out amongst from the heathen nations. God's still calling people out from amongst the heathen nations today. Amen. amen. He still has a clarion call that he's that he wants to herald in the streets even. You see, the, nowadays it's not too cool to go around passing out tracts or even to be willing to go out into the public and to tell people about Jesus because it makes the people in the church uncomfortable when you talk that way. But I'm here to tell you that when you read the scriptures for the way that they're written, God is designed to separate for himself out a people, a peculiar people, amen, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that will show forth the praises of him. And, and so God had called this man named Abraham out and through this man, he gave a promise. He gave a promise that through his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. A seed that ultimately we know finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Paul told us that in Galatians chapter 3. So it wasn't just that nation that we see over there that everybody's wanting to send and listen to me. And let me be careful that I don't get irreverent here. But everybody's wanting to send all of the Jewish people back to the land. And we could become so focused on that physical piece of property that we realize that property belongs to Jesus. Amen. He is the darling of heaven. He is the promised seed. Amen. Amen. And, and so what we have to stay focused on is the plan of the eternal God. And what I want you to know is, is that, that God created this people called Israel. And we know that, that, that Abraham had a son and, and that he had two sons. And, and that ultimately the 12 tribes of Jacob came from Jacob, which was the 12 tribes of Israel, swelled to a great nation in Exodus. 
And then that time frame came where God delivered them out on that Passover night. If you'll remember that story where they had to strike blood upon the doorpost and the side post. And it's representative of our salvation experience. The blood of the lamb had to pay the, the penalty or cover the penalty of the children of Israel on that night. And the question that you and I must ask ourselves is, have we stricken the blood of the lamb upon the doorpost of our heart? Amen. Amen. And on that night, they went through on dry ground through the Red Sea, and then there came a wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. Disobedient time after disobedient time. And I have to tell you that the time frame of the wilderness wanderings reminds me very much, actually the wilderness and the book of Judges remind me very much of my early Christianity. A persistent wandering of disobedience, refusing to bow the knee to Jesus. And it's almost as though the Lord was saying, if you're not ready to pass the test yet, you can take one more lap around the wilderness, son. Because you see, God is faithful. He is faithful and He is going to persevere and He is going to endure until the end. And if you're going to say that you're His child and you're going to dare to step into your prayer closet and cry out to Him and say, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. And Lord, if you're going to say, if you're going to say, Lord, conform me into the image of your precious Son, Jesus. If you dare to challenge the Lord that way, He's patient. Amen. He's patient. He's not going to give up on you. But the truth of the matter is, is that many of us, or let me speak for Matt, myself, stiff-necked and stubborn and hard-headed and refusing to bow the knee. And so the Lord <laughs> says, take one more lap around the wilderness, son. We're going to get this right sooner or later. Oh, and so here we go. Through the wilderness time frame, they come into the judges. And, and, you know, the time frame of the judges once again reminds me of my walk with God because there's like a peak in a valley, a roller coaster ride, if you will, where the, where the people of God are cheating on him and he allows them to be taken captive under the bondage of their enemy repeatedly. And then when they find themselves under the bondage, they cry out to God and they say, Lord, please send us a deliverer. And he sends them a powerful judge, whether it be Samson or Deborah or Gideon, and he delivers them out from under the bondage of their enemy only to find them cheating on him once again. That's my Christian story also. Unfortunately, I have to say. But then, you know, what happens is after a time frame, the children of Israel begin to cry out. They begin to cry out that they want a king. And I know that I've told you this story many times, and I hope that you'll just be patient with me. I'm just trying to remind you of salvation history. You should never get tired of hearing God's story. As a matter of fact, the Lord told me about two years ago, preach my story. Tell my people my story. Remind them of my story. And so that's what I do from time to time. I just want to remind you of the story of God. Because you see, we live in the midst of a world that wants to forget our God. We live in the midst of a world that believes that this is just another book written by men. And it's just, you know, it's, it's not anything different than any other book. But God wants us to be reminded of the story and his long suffering and his plan and his loving kindness towards us. And so here, the people of Israel, after the, during this time frame of the judges, actually Samuel was still the last judge during the time frame of Saul as he was anointed king. And the people began to scream, give us a king. And you know why they wanted a king? Because they wanted to be like the other nations around them. How many times in the church are we wanting to be like the world around us? In other words, we want to embrace their methods. It's going on in the church right now. We want to embrace their methodology. We want to make things look groovy and cool. We want to dim the lights and hit the strobes and even got some smoke machines going on in some of these places. Okay, we want to crank up the music. We want to get a little bit of beat going to our stuff. And the truth, all I'm trying to say is, do we think that by embracing the ways of the world that we're going to lead people to a real Jesus? No. They're what these young people are going to be thinking is, oh man, it's cool over here. It's a social club. Let's go hang out is what we're doing. Are we really giving them Jesus and giving them an atmosphere and an opportunity to give their life to Christ? That's the question I have. That's what Israel wanted. They wanted to look like the rest of the world. Give us a king, God. Well, God had a king in mind. He had already prophesied in Genesis chapter 49 that the scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. In other words, there's going to be a king. I'm, I, have him in, I, have him in wait, I have him in wait. I'm preparing him for the time frame. But Israel, like many of us, got ahead of God. Demanding what they want. I know they got some people in this room that if they were honest, they could say, you know what, I've done that before. I know I have. Demanded what I want. Not willing to wait. Justifying in my mind that this is of God. And the reality of it is it only produced heartache. 
Come God on. told him, I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you Saul, but he's not going to provide for you what you think he's going to provide for you. He's going to make your men work. He's going to put you under labor. But then came the good news of David. Amen. He was a man after God's own heart. He never bowed down to false idols. He made mistakes. Listen, that's the life of the Christian. We've all failed God. But you know, when David failed God, and we don't have time to preach that. I wish we did. I love that story. When David failed God, at a time when kings went off to war, David stayed behind, and there he saw Bathsheba. Yeah. Called her over there. I said I wasn't going to preach it, and I find myself preaching. <laughs> Called her over there and did what he did, and then he impregnated that woman. And if you study the life of Uzziah, he was actually one of David's mighty men. So this is a man that's on the battlefield that's fighting for his king. Fighting for king and country. And here, David, a man after God's own heart, goes and cheats and transgresses a very law that says there is no sacrifice to offer if you do this thing. And at the same time, when he finds out what he's done, he calls him off the front lines and he actually allows premeditated murder to take place. Two sins that David committed that there was no sacrifice to offer. But what does he do when the prophet comes to him and tells him what the story is about the poor little, the Lord of poor man with the one little sheep? He says, who is this man? And he was going to take care of him. He says, you be that man. Yeah. And he falls prostrate upon the ground before his God that he loves so dearly. The very one that he had learned to sing psalms to and write songs to in the fields. And he repents before God in sackcloth and ashes. David is a man after God's own heart. You've got to understand something, Christian. You're going to make mistakes in this journey. And I want to tell you something, though, that the God that loves you, the God that you love, if you will find yourself prostrate in His presence, and if you will pour your heart out to Him, He is a loving and a merciful and a kind God, and He will forgive you and He will restore you, and He will allow you to rise up, and He will fulfill the promises that He has spoken in you. But the enemy of your soul wants to convince you that you're guilty, that you're condemned, and that there's no hope for you. I'm here to tell you that He's a liar and the father of lies. Amen? Don't believe what the devil tells you. God's working this plan of salvation history through thousands of years of human history all for the point of bringing Messiah. All for the point that you and I could find salvation and our guilt and our condemnation can be done away with. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. But then we find this concept here, Solomon. Solomon. Solomon, as, as I've already pointed out to you, and I want to keep it before your mind, the Bible says he was the wisest man that ever lived. But at the same time, the wisest man that ever lived, lived transgressed God in a way that was, that was unthinkable. He went after foreign women. He married himself an Egyptian, Pharaoh's daughter. But not only that, he continued to marry foreign women, which God had warned against. And the reason that God warned against it was because he told them that they're going to draw your heart away from me. That's why we cannot be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Come out from amongst them, says the Lord. What fellowship does light have with darkness? Some people say, man, this is old school preaching. No, this is save your life preaching. Christian. We can't connect yourself to the world. And I'm going to take it a step further. Don't be unequally yoked with Christians that don't even understand what you understand about the gospel. You're going to find yourself some good looking dude that just got saved yesterday? No. You, if you've been in the faith and you've been through the journey and you've wandered in the wilderness and you've bowed your knee to Jesus and you've laid prostrate on the ground before the Lord and God has spoken to you, what in the world are you doing yoking yourself with some Christian that is down here while you're up here? No, Christian, they're going to drag you down. It doesn't mean that you can't be brothers and sisters in the Lord with that person as God rises them up and proves to you that this might be the one. But when I say brothers and sisters in the Lord, that's what I mean. I'm old school. I learned the hard way. Come on, somebody. You can't sit there and make out with somebody and thinking that just because you're making out that it's okay, man. There's spirits of lust connected to that stuff. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about if you're not married, you can't get alone with a person and begin to have intimate contact with that person and think that it's not going to be taken to another level. That's not reality. That's, right. Amen. That's just the truth, man. And if you don't believe me, then go ahead and connect yourself to it and find out what happens. Take another trip around the wilderness. And I hope, oh, Jesus, I hope because I care enough about people to pray that way. I hope that you don't buy into it and, and, and hook, line, and sinker yourself into a mess that you can't find yourself getting out of. Come on now. 
So Solomon made his mistake, and the kingdom was split, and in that, Israel was is at the top, and, and I didn't write it here, but Judah was the southern portion of the kingdom. Should have wore a belt. <laughs> Judah was the southern portion of the kingdom. You can wear a belt. And so, Judah is where we get the word Jew from. This is where the Jewish people, this is where the, the Jewish part of it comes from. Israel was connected in this area of Samaria. That's where the uh, Re, uh, Jeroboam built an altar and caused the people not to go to Jerusalem to worship God in the temple. And so, therefore, they began to offer up false God, I, offer up idols, idol worship and false gods in the temple over here in Samaria. And that's where all of this confusion between the Samaritans and the Jews came from. And that maybe would help you when you go back and read John chapter 4 about the Samaritan woman. Right. Right. But in 722 B.C., Assyria takes control of Israel. And now here we are in Isaiah 700 B.C., and this is the point I brought all that because I wanted to give you some context of where we are in the time frame of Isaiah. And first, I want to go ahead and, and talk to you a little bit. See, I, once again, when I started, I wanted you to know that tonight I want to talk to you about the suffering servant. The, the title of my message has something to do with the fact that he was a man acquainted with grief and sorrow. And I want you to know that no matter what you're going through on this earth today, the God that you serve, the Jesus that you love, the one that you ask to come live in your heart, he's already been acquainted with the grief and the sorrows that you're experiencing upon this earth today. Amen? But you need to get a revelation that God's plan is bigger than just healing your individual situation. He wants to heal your situation. He wants to make you whole. He wants to cause you to mount up with wings of eagles. He wants to allow you to run and not grow weary. Amen? But he's doing it for a purpose because he gave his life for you and he's asking you to spend your life on him Come on, if you're not all in then I don't know if you're really in Come on, and I understand it's a process for us to come to that way of thinking but in Isaiah chapter 1 it says right here in verse 2 chapter 1 verse 2 middle part of the verse God says to Israel I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, let's go back to our little timeline right here. Let's consider the, the effort, if we could speak in human terms, that God has been working this salvation history to get us to the point right here where he has a people after his own name that he has created. He has created children. He has nourished them. And now... The Word of God says that they have rebelled against Him. And He goes on in verse 4. Oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger. They are gone away backwards, backslidden. Right. God's people turning in the opposite direction of Him. He says, why should you be stricken anymore? <laughs> At this point, what good is it going to do for me to even afflict you? What good is it going to do for me to bring chastisement into your life? You're not responding whenever I allow trials to hit you. You're not coming to the place where you bow your knee and become prostrate. What good is it going to do for me to strike you anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. I fear where we are in the modern church. Everybody's looking for some kind of a spiritual, uh, some kind of weird stuff going on out there. Listen, the Holy Spirit does move and operate with gifts, amen? But listen, when we start thinking that revival is something that it's not, revival changes the heart of a man. Revival is a fire that spread to and causes salvation to be desired in the hearts of other people. And there's some strange fire out there, folks. All kinds of strange fire that's entering the church and they're calling it a spirit, but it isn't the Holy Spirit. Ain't no sense in wiping the sweat, brother. It ain't stopping tonight. <laughs> he says, come on now. Let, let, this is where I wanted to bring you. Verse 18, chapter 1, verse 18. It says, come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He wants to reason with his people. He wants to have a sit down. You know, that's exactly what it means. It's the idea of a sit-down. It's like having a conference. He wants to talk to his people. 
Now, the reasoning, don't be confused, is not that as though we're going to convince him that something's not sin anymore. But come on, God, that's a good idea. Let's sit down and reason. I mean, times are changing, Lord. You know, things are a lot more liberal nowadays. People are much more open-minded. You know, that whole man not lie with man thing is kind of uncomfortable and it's not real cool with today's society. No, God's word says in Leviticus 18... Amen. That man shall not lie with man. It says in Romans chapter 1 that the ultimate epitome of the abomination when mankind turns his heart against God is that it results in man lying with man and woman lying with woman. It's in his word. I understand why it's causing confusion because nobody believes the word anymore. Come on, that's right, that's right. And now the sad thing is, is that we have people in the homosexual community who say that they're okay with God. God wants them to be able to love and so therefore they say that it's got to be okay. But no, no, ma'am, no, sir, you didn't look at the word of God. The word was God, of God was clear. He never changed it. That's right. Come on, man. You're not going to convince God that, that fornicators won't enter the kingdom of heaven. His word said it. You're not going to convince God that drunkenness is not a lust of the flesh and that drunkards can't enter the kingdom of heaven. God's word said it. But good news, good news. He said, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. That's what God wants to reason. He wants to reason with us that he has a plan. A plan that he's been working for thousands of years. Amen. And through this plan, it has to be communicated. Isaiah chapter 6. We're still talking about the big plan of God right now. We haven't even really gotten to the suffering servant yet. But it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated upon the throne. Now, the word Uzziah, the name Uzziah literally means Jehovah is my strength. Sadly, for Israel, just as they started with Saul, it never stopped. They looked to their kings for their strength. What's interesting to me is that Uzziah says, in the year the strength died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. Mm -hmm. See, I'm going to tell you something right now. If you're going to walk around puffed up with pride and religious pride, you probably are not really entering the presence of God. You can say that you went to a church service and that the music was beautiful and you even got some frizzles or some goosebumps. But I'm here to tell you that when you enter into the presence of a holy God, something happens to you. It says, this is the picture of what it looked like. It says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. And above it stood seraphims. One had six wings, and with two He covered His face, with two He covered His feet, and with two He did fly. And He cried, and they cried to one another, they cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Look at this, and the post of the door moved at the voice of Him that cried. The post of the door of the temple began to move. They were bowing in and out at the voice of the one that cried. Wow. I'm here to tell you that when somebody will begin to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen, begin to proclaim the glory of the, of the eternal God, it will begin to move the doorposts of your heart, child of God. Oh, it will begin to move the doorposts of your heart, sinner. If you will listen to the word of God and you will respond to it properly, it will begin to move the posts of your heart amen. to let the Holy Ghost come in, amen, to let him come and to live with you. He goes on to say, then said I, woe is me. He said, woe is me for I am a man. I'm sorry, he said, I'm undone. The idea means to be silent, to be silenced. Have you ever been in the presence of God and you were silenced? I know that Robert and I used to talk about that. Robert said when he first got back from prison, there were times that he'd wake up in the morning and he used to turn and put his feet on the side of the bed and he would just say the name of God or whatever. And he said, I'm just sitting there. I can't even say a word. Can't even say a word after that. The presence of God has a way of silencing us. Come on, brother. He says, I'm undone. Amen. He says, I'm undone. I'm silent because I'm a man of unclean lips. <laughs> Isaiah is receiving a revelation as he's entered into the presence of God. And he says, I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. Now I want to remind you of something. This is the children of God. This is the people of God. This is the prophet of God. And whenever he enters into the presence of God, he's able to see who he really is on the inside. But the good news is, once again, God's plan. See, because one of the seraphim take tongs 
from, and a coal from the altar. That's the altar of sacrifice. It's an Old Testament type of the cross. And the coal touches his lips and he says that he is forgiven, amen, of his sin. But then the next thing that happens is they, God says to him, who will we send? You see, whenever you've been living your life in such a way that it was unpleasing to God, but then you enter into the presence of God and he begins to reveal to you the condition of your heart. Amen. And he begins to forgive you and you become overwhelmed with his loving kindness. The process that takes place next is, is you have a desire to reciprocate to him, not to play church. Not to do the social club thing, but instead to be a light in the midst of darkness and to be salt upon the earth. He says, whom will we send? And Isaiah says, send me, Lord. Okay. So God's going to send him with a message and there's going to be a response to the message. We're talking about the overarching plan here. God has a plan. He's producing a people through these people. He's going to communicate the love of God to a lost and dying world. Through these people, he's going to bring forth Messiah. And Messiah is going to communicate the plan of God to a lost and dying world. Amen. And Messiah is going to die on the cross for our sin. And, and Messiah is going to produce his own special people. People like that are sitting in this room who are supposed to proclaim the word of the living God. And let me tell you something. I know some of you in here have already been doing it. Some of you in here have already been desiring to be a witness for Jesus Christ and you're getting frustrated. And you're saying, people aren't responding the way that I want them to respond. The word of the Lord told you how they were going to respond right here. Some are going to be joyful. Some are going to be joyful and thankful. Some, the seed's going to lie dormant for a period of time, but it doesn't mean it won't spring forth to bring a harvest. Some, some are going to deafen their ears. That's what it says right here. He said, go tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. See, God's telling Isaiah, now that you've seen my presence, now that you've been converted, or that you're, you've realized who you are, now that you've been forgiven and you have an overwhelming desire to do my work, I want you to go preach my gospel, but you need to understand something, Isaiah. They're not all going to respond. As a matter of fact, they're, they're, you know, I, I can turn real quick to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14. See, now this is the prophet right here. The weeping prophet. Weeping over Israel. Still in, bo still in bondage. This is, this is, I don't know exactly how many years. I don't want to lie to you. Probably maybe 70 years after Isaiah's prophesying. Condition of the church of Israel is only worsening. They're not responding. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 14. It says, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. Who's they? The prophets. He said in chapter 5 that the prophets prophesy falsely. And my people love it so. I have to tell you that the same thing is going on in the church today. There's people that are saying one thing and it's not the truth of the gospel. And the people are loving it because it's allowing them to stay comfortable in the midst of the pew. And the condition of the church is in disarray. He says, they have healed the hurt of my daughter, of my, the daughter of my people slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, we're amalgamating today or making a mixture. Got a pharmacist in the house. We're doing the work of the apothecary. We're mixing some stuff together. And it's not, we're mixing some psychology with our theology. We're mixing some worldliness with our holiness. And we're making up a mixture that's palatable for the people that they can tolerate. But I'm here to tell you, my concern is, is that we have pews filled with people that may not really be saved. We might even dunk them into water. I'm not saying that there's no true salvation. Please understand what I'm saying. But just because you go under the water doesn't mean that you've truly repented. Doesn't mean that you've truly given your life over to Jesus. They say peace, peace when there is no peace. And then it says in verse 15, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Couldn't even produce a blush at this point in time. 
They shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Oh, look at this. It gets, it gets good right here. Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways. What does that mean? The crossways. Go find the intersection. In other words, go find where people are doing commerce, where there's a large group of people that are walking back and forth, and ask them. Cry out to them. And what do you want to know? He says, see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Back to Isaiah chapter 6. This is a chronic problem with the people of God. He says, go and preach this gospel though their hearts may become fat and their ears may become heavy and they will not be able to see. I'm going to go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 61 and this is where we're going to transition over to the uh, suffering servant. Uh, Isaiah chapter 61. It says in Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. You know, Jesus also quoted this about Himself in Luke chapter 4. And so this tells us right here that these passages in Isaiah that speak of the suffering servant are referring to Jesus because He Himself says this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him and has anointed him to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to those that are captive. And in Luke, he talks about, the, he talks about and to pr proclaim liberty also to them which are bruised. Right. Now, i got to tell you something, that, that in, just as it was then, and just as it was at the time frame of Jesus, so it is today, that there are people, the children of God, that are captive. They're, they're, they're not walking in freedom and liberty. They're captive and bound by religion. Right. You've you got to understand something, that when Jesus showed up on the scene during that time frame of Israel's history, John the Baptist came in the wilderness. The Bible says that that year there were two high priests, Annas and Caiaphas. Right. But the word of the Lord came to John the Baptist. A man with a, with a beard and wearing camel and, and, and a leather belt huh? and locusts in his beard. And he ate, he ate honey and, and he ate locusts. And he began to cry and he began to preach, repent. And he, because he was, in the, in the words of the prophet, preparing the way for the Lord, the hadas, the pathway. Because the path had become obscured by religion. And even today, people are having a difficult time of understanding what is the true Christianity. Because they're running after things that, are, that they're saying is Christianity. And they're running after signs and they're running after wonders. And people are seeking after the man of God to lay his hands on them so that they can float down or hear some kind of word. But what about this word? And I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe that people operate in the gift and the word of prophecy. But what are we doing? What about getting in the presence of God and hearing from His word? He says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. To bind up the broken heart. And see, some of you are broken hearted. Some of you have been through some things. But I'm here to tell you that if you'll hold on to Jesus and you'll hold on to His Word, He's going to bring you through. Come on, man. He's going to bring you through and He's going to build you up and He's going to strengthen you. Amen. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Why? Right here. That they might be called trees of righteousness. Amen. The planting of the Lord. That He might be glorified. Come on now. See, that's what I was trying to tell you, that, that God has a plan. Amen? God has a plan through it all. Isaiah chapter 53. And this is what I really wanted to preach. Yeah. Talking still about the suffering servant, Isaiah 53. It says, Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? You know, the arm of the Lord is descriptive of God's strength. Right, come on now. So you want to know who the strength of God is going to be revealed to? Those that are willing to believe the report of the Lord. Then the report of the Lord is the communication of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
To believe that Jesus is the Christ. To believe that what He did at the cross, amen, was enough to set the captive free. Not just to get you to heaven, but to give you victory on earth today. That no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're going through, your position in Christ gives you access to the grace of God, which will transform and strengthen your life. Amen. Amen. Come on now. He says, this is the one that the Lord will be revealed to. He says, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 11. I want to talk to you a little bit about that root. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and in verse 10, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Verse 10, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign or a sign or a banner of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. In other words, God has a plan if, you know who Jesse is, right? Jesse is David's father. This goes back to the promise that was given to David in 2 Samuel. Amen. That from when David goes to sleep with his fathers, that he would establish the throne of his seed after him. That was talking about Jesus. And it would be an everlasting throne. And so what we're seeing here is the root of Jesse, which is the offspring, which is David, which is the offspring, which is Christ. And God wants us to know, so we're going back to Isaiah chapter 53. Because it says right here, in verse 2, we're talking about the suffering servant. It says, He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. What a tender plant. A king that was born to die. Born as a babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger, not even amongst common people, but unclean animals. Your King of kings and Lord of lords. He, he took upon himself robed in humility. Philippians 2.6 says, the same mind that was in Christ also needs to be in you. Come on now. Who, in the, though he was in the form of God, he considered it not something to be held to, but instead he humbled himself. He humbled himself and became human flesh for a purpose so that he could be obedient. Obedient to what? To death. Even the death of a cross. God is desiring that his people would emulate the master. God is desiring that the same heart that was in Jesus would be in you and I. He says, he, and he, came, he was a tender plant. And he came out from a root of dry ground. And, and when, as we look at Israel and Judah's Travels and, and how they were moving so far away from God. And even when we get to this point here, Zedekiah, the last king that would rule from Jerusalem, because of their disobedience and their refusal to listen to the prophet Jeremiah, Babylon comes and they grab Zedekiah, they chain him and they gouge out his eyes and they march into Babylon. For 400 or more years, there's silence. There's no more prophets speaking. Because the Spirit of God isn't speaking to the people because they've been disobedient and they refuse to hear His plea. Be careful, Christian. Be careful whenever there's things in your heart that God's dealing with and you're refusing to listen to them because what can happen is you will find yourself separated from the presence of God and no longer hearing His voice and it's a scary place to be. Trust me, I know I've been there. At the same time, God is a God of love and He's a God of refreshing. And when you finally do fall to your knees, you'll probably appreciate His presence at that moment in time more than you ever did before. Amen. 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 He says He was a tender plant. He was a root coming out of dry ground. All hope seemed lost at this point. I couldn't write anymore. I would have wrote on a wall. But at the time that Jesus comes, Rome, the Roman Empire has Israel as a vassal state. In other words, they were basically slaves under, under Rome's empire. And they were so blinded by their religion. Do you remember the conversation Jesus had with the Pharisees? When I don't remember exactly what it was that he told them, but he says that you say that, that we would be free. We've never been in bondage to any man. Well, what are you talking about? 
That's what religion does to you. It blinds you. You're in bondage and you can't even see it. They were in Israel was in bondage to Assyria, Judah, and then in the bondage to Babylon. And then it went from there to Medo-Persia, which is modern-day Iran. And then it went to Greece. And now it's Rome. So while Jesus is talking to them at that point in time, they're saying, we've never been in bondage to anybody. And they're slaves. And that's what's going to happen to many Christians today. They think that they're fine. They're going through the motions of church. And the reality of it is, is that no, it's not okay. The prophets prophesy falsely. They say, peace, peace. They tell my daughter. They heal her slightly. Give her a practical message and try to fix her marriage. But the truth of the matter is, is that you can't preach Jacob and Esau as though it's a parenting class. And you can't preach Abraham and Sarai as though it's a marriage course. We're talking about the eternal plan of God here. Yes, along the way, if you will let the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords live in your heart and rule and reign in your heart, He will heal your marriage. He will heal your children. He will heal your land. We're twisting the scriptures. We're presenting them to the people in such a way that it's applied, that it's, it's, making, them, it's making them desirous of what they want to hear. Because it's a felt need. They're feeling a need for their marriage to be fixed. So they want to hear a, a message about a marriage. They're feeling a need for their children to be fixed. So they want to hear a, a message about a child. It, does, it doesn't work that way. Yes, you can find principles about marriage in the word of God. Of course you can. Yes, you can find principles about child rearing in the word of God. But who are we trying to get to fix our marriage? Are we trying to present the word in such a way that it's just some type of an external counseling session? Or are we trying to present the word in such a way that the Holy Spirit can get in our hearts and do a deep work? Because that's what the covenant of grace does. Amen. It reaches into the heart of man and it begins to transform who he is. And if we're not leading the people to that Jesus, we're not leading them to anything. Amen. Jesus paid a high price so that the Holy Spirit could deal with your hearts. Jesus paid a high price so that the Holy Spirit could deal with my hearts. Amen. Amen. He wants to deal with those inner, those deep, dark places. Come on, man. He wants you to come clean. Not, not just, listen, man, I'm talking about your attitudes towards people. Matt's attitude towards people. If he's thinking the wrong thing about somebody, he better bring it to the Lord and let God deal with it. If, you, if we would start listening and learning the word of God and learning how to walk in Christ and learning how to truly be led by the Holy Spirit, we'd need the pastor a whole lot less. We'd start listening to the word of God and we'd start judging our own selves so that we wouldn't have to be judged. We started looking at the word of God as though it were a mirror and letting the Holy Ghost deal with our hearts and say, Lord, what manner of man am I? Help us, Lord. Help me. Help me, Lord. Humble me in your presence. Humble me according to your word, Lord. He says it here that he has no beauty that we would desire him. The real Jesus is not really what's happening in society. What's happening in society is people want to be, see sizzle and pop. They want to see sizzle and pop. They want to see glitter and gold. They want to see the big crowd. They want to see the, 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 the music in an entertainment fashion. They want to see all of this type of stuff. That's not, that's not where Jesus is. No, no. Come on, man. I like convertible Corvettes, and I think Michael Kors makes cool watches. Jesus isn't impressed. He could care less. Amen. But so much of our mindset, so much of our thinking has been skewed by this world system and what we call cool and what we call relevant. I'm telling you, it has affected the way we see the gospel. Help us, Lord. It says there's no beauty in him that we should despise, that we should desire him. And it says in verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief. Matthew chapter 27. He was a man that was despised and he was rejected. Can I tell you something? <laughs> that if you're going to connect yourself to the real Jesus, 
I mean, the real gospel. What, what's going to happen is, is that a transformation is going to take place in your life. You're going to start to separate yourself from that which does not, is not right. You're going to separate yourself from the imposter. You're going to start making decisions that are going to separate you from even people in the church. Come on, man. And what's going to happen is, is that you also may begin to be rejected and despised by the people that you once cared about. The question that you and I have to ask ourselves is, is are we in this thing for real or not? Do we, are we really, do we really believe that this is God's word, that this is his plan, and that he's calling out a separated people to be light in the midst of darkness? I understand it's a process. Amen? It's a process. But when you begin to, make a, to draw a line in the sand and you say, no, I don't go there anymore. I don't do that anymore. I'm telling you. They're going to reject you and they're going to despise you. A spirit of religion will rise up in them and they will begin to call you names even if they're not saying it to your face, they'll say it behind your back. Come on, man, bro. Matthew chapter 27, verse 27. The soldiers mocked him and despised him. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the common hall and they gathered unto him a whole band of soldiers. They stripped him and they put on a scarlet robe and when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. The soldiers mocked him and, and also the world mocked him. Look at verse 39. They, they, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, saying, You that was going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you be the Son of God. Come down from that cross. So the soldiers mocked him. The world mocked him. You think they're not going to still mock him today, Christian? You think that when you take a stand for Jesus and you're willing to proclaim his name in public, that they're not going to look at you cross-eyed, that they're not going to talk about you behind your back? You need to make sure that you're really ready to be involved in this thing because it's only going to get worse as the times continue down the pathway that they're continuing down. Amen. The soldiers mocked him, the world mocked him, religion mocked him. Look at verse 41. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others himself. He cannot say. They did this to your Jesus, Christian. They mocked him. They put a robe on him. They, they put the crown of thorns on him. They blindfolded him. They slapped him and said, Prophesy now, son of man. They did this to our Jesus. says that likewise the chief priest they mocked him. Religion's going to mock him. I'm telling you, the religion will mock you. I don't mean to keep repeating myself and saying the same thing time and again, but I've seen it. I can remember vividly when the Lord got a hold of my life. You understand that I, I've told you too many times, but I'm going to say it again. I was in bondage as a Christian. I viewed everybody that wanted to do something for God. I, and it didn't happen right away. When I first got saved, man, I was excited. I mean, some of y'all might remember. Mr. Paul, you probably remember when I walked in that church the first time with that long hair. And then when I first time I ever wanted to talk to your daughter, if I was you, I would have got a gun. I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> but I can remember that night when she preached and I went up to that altar and I bowed my knee and I said, God, something's wrong with me. I need you. And every service, I went to that altar and I bowed my knee. They told me, you don't have to keep coming up. I said, I just want to make sure I'm all right. I got baptized three times. Amen. Amen. And you know, for a while I was good. Until I got caught up in religion. Come on, man. I was no longer connected to the real Jesus. I wasn't accessing grace. I was frustrating grace. I was in a system of works and legalism. Instead of freedom and liberty, I found myself bound up again. But on that glorious night, after my sister had died, and, or that morning when I had woken and began to worship the Lord and I began to be set free, the most wonderful thing happened. I started talking. My, my language changed. You want to talk about a different language? I received a new language. Yes, I spoke in other tongues. But I'm talking about another language. I started speaking the language of gospel. What started coming out of my mouth was Jesus. 
And let me tell you something. The people around me, even some of the people in my own family, they didn't like it. They started to say, you, you don't need to preach at me. I know the Jesus you know. I'm like, and one day I had to tell my mom. God bless her soul. I don't know. if She may watch this one day. I don't know. But she said, you don't need to preach at me. And I said, Mom, is that what you think? You think I'm preaching at you? No, I'm not preaching. This is me. Come this on. is who I am. I'm your son. And, and I fell in love with a man and his name is Jesus. And I'm going to talk about him. I'm going to talk about my Jesus because he set me free. Amen. And I can remember talking to people in the church. I remember one guy that he came up to me. He goes, come on, Matt. What's all this stuff about, man? It's like he had a face of weary. I was like he was burdening him because I was excited about Jesus. I'm talking about the Lord, man. You, yo, it was cool when we were talking about the saints. Come on, man. But now, now I want to talk about the darling of heaven, the one that died to shed his blood, shed his blood for us and set us free. And, and I've been set free from the dead, man. I'm no longer a captive. Jesus was anointed to preach the gospel to set the captive free. Y'all know, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You start talking about Jesus around the church and how confusing was that for me? Because here I am, I'm talking about Jesus around Christians. A lot of times what they think at first though is they, a self, I'm telling you, a self-righteous spirit rises up in them and what they start thinking is is that you think you're holier than now, or you think you've arrived, or you're self-righteous, or all this kind of stuff. And it's right. like, no, that's not it, man. I just want to talk about the Lord, and I thought maybe that you might want to talk about Him with me. Come on, brother. Yeah. So whenever you find yourself in the midst of those circumstances, and you find yourself around people that are going to begin to ostracize you, and ridicule you, and, 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 and despise you, and reject you because you talk about Jesus, maybe you need to find some new people to hang out with. Come on, man. Amen. 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 That's what I pray. God would send me some people that are on fire for Jesus. So that we can reach some lost people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Alright. So the soldiers mocked him. Religion mocked him. And then even right here, the thieves also mocked him. The thieves also, verse 44, which were crucified with him, they cast the same in his teeth. Meaning they threw the same words in his face. Right, come on. Now the good news is, if you read all the Gospels, you'll begin to see, just like it says here, that both of those thieves, on either side when they started it off, they were both mocking and ridiculing along with everyone else. And we know the story. One of them gave their heart to Jesus before that day was over. But I envisioned in my mind and in my heart this thief mocking Jesus, but yet watching with his eyes everything that's going on. The world walking by, wagging their heads. Oh yeah, you said you were going to pull yourself down off the cross. Why can't, or you were going to restore the temple. Go ahead, pull yourself down. Can't even save himself. He saw, he saw the, the chief priest ridiculing and mocking him. I would imagine that that thief thought in his heart for a moment, something's not right here. Yeah. Because these are supposed to be our religious leaders. And they're full of hatred. And they're full of bitterness. And they're full of envy. And look how he responds. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. And somewhere along the way, a transformation took place in that brother's heart. On, brother. So I want to encourage you something with something. Some of the people that are ridiculing you, some of the people that are despising you, may be the very people that are on the brink right. of giving their heart uh -huh. to Jesus. Right. Amen? Yeah. So you start lifting them up, you start lifting them up and you keep living your life for the Lord. Yes. Use wisdom. Let the Lord lead you and guide you. But don't you start stop talking about your Jesus. Amen. 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 Oh, man. Praise God. Amen. As you're going through this journey and you find yourself at all sides and people coming against you and people despising you as you take your stand for the Lord, as you go through the trials of life, and you find yourself in all types of tribulations. Because you know the Lord did say that on this earth we would have tribulation. As you find yourself navigating this journey called life. And, find, and, and once again experiencing all of these things. The enemy wants to try to convince you that you're all alone. He wants to isolate you and he wants to tell you that nobody cares. It's his old famous trick. It's just like. 
It's just like a, a lion, you know, in Africa. Whenever they want to look for the weak animal, they want to look at the one that's that's running away from the pack that can't keep up. They want to isolate that animal, that weakened animal, and they want to destroy it. And I just want you to know something, that the enemy of your soul wants to do the same thing to you. He wants to isolate you. He wants to convince you that nobody cares, that nobody loves you. And you're going to walk around. People walk around and they say to themselves in their spirit, nobody loves me. Come on, man. I'm isolated. I'm separated. I'm here to tell you, don't say it again, Christian. Amen. Don't say it again because it's not true. Amen. See, Jesus was separated. Jesus was separated for you, but you are not alone. I'm here to tell you, even in the physical world, Jesus, I can think of a time in John chapter 7, whenever it was about time for the Feast of the Tabernacles, and Jesus had gone up to Galilee, to his hometown, and the Bible says that his own brothers had rejected him, and they were mocking him. And they said, why don't you go down to Jerusalem to the feast, and reveal yourselves to your disciples, and reveal yourselves to the whole world. Don't they all have a right to know? Mocking him as though, sure, you're the Messiah. Jesus said, it's not time for me to go yet. The Bible says that as soon as his brothers took off, Jesus waited a little while and then he started the journey himself. And you know one of the things I noticed is that the Bible explicitly says that his brothers wanted him to go down to Jerusalem to reveal himself to his disciples. That means his disciples were down here. Jesus was up here. His brothers were over here. Jesus is over here. In the physical realm, Jesus is walking this journey alone or at least him and the Father. Yeah, See, I want you to know something that there's going to be times in your life and I've heard my pastor say this before. There's going to be times in your life that nobody may not be there. You may send out a text. You may try to throw out a call. And nobody can respond. And immediately the enemy will want to jump on you and tell you that nobody cares. When the reality of it is, somebody might be leading somebody through the prayer of salvation right there. Somebody might be praying for somebody else. But the enemy wants to convince you that you're all alone. But I'm here to tell you that the gospel of Jesus Christ will teach you how to get a hold of Jesus. Will teach you how in the midst of your brokenness to get alone with Him. I want you to know that Jesus in the physical, He got alone many times with the Lord, oh, with the Father. Mark 130, Mark 135, before the sun came up, I'm paraphrasing, He got alone in a solitary place, and there He prayed. Amen. See, sometimes it's about, you, it's about you and I doing business with God. Amen? Oh, Amen. Amen. But not only that, I want you to know, don't say that you're alone. Don't say that you're isolated because Jesus took the real isolation for you. It says that it was about the ninth hour. Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As the weight of humanity's sin was laid upon your Savior, the Father had to turn His head because of your sin that lied upon His precious Son. He took your separation. From the presence of God, the one who never failed, the one who was always obedient, took your sin upon him as the sin offering and experienced separation from the eternal God for you and in your place so that you wouldn't have to experience it. So I don't know what you're going through. Some of you, maybe I know a little bit of it, but I don't know exactly how you feel emotionally. I know how I felt emotionally whenever my sister died. I know how much pain I experienced, but in the midst of that pain and tragedy, I found a, a new relationship with the Lord like I could have never imagined in a million years. What I want you to know is, is that Jesus is our suffering servant and He wants to get us to the place uh, where He wants to bring healing to our lives. He wants to make us whole. It just I'm just going to close with this in verse 4. It says, Surely He has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes, we are healed. Amen. Father, we just thank You and praise You. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for sending precious Jesus to die in our place. Maybe there's someone that's been watching the video and you would say, my life is in chaos. And I don't really know what I'm going to do. I don't feel as though I have anywhere to turn. I want to tell you to turn to Jesus. I want to encourage you right now, wherever you are, get, fall to your knees. Put your hands in the air. Just begin to say His name. Say Jesus. 
Begin to just speak His name, Jesus. Invite Him into your heart and ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Find yourself a good church. Stay connected with us. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray for each and every person that watches this video. I pray for every single person in this room tonight. Lord, You see where they are in their walk with You. You see what they need from You. Holy Spirit, I pray that You would minister to their needs in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God.